name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Thank you, dear Lord, for all your blessings this day and this opportunity to come and open up your word. Please, Lord, bless us um, and help us as we continue to dive through this book of Hebrews and help us to see who you are and, and how you fulfilled everything of the Old Testament and have brought us into a more an intimate relation, a deeper and intimate relationship with you. So help us to challenge ourselves to go yet uh, another layer into uh, understanding this book of Hebrews. Uh, through the intercessions of all your saints here, so as we say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as in heaven, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is kingdom, the power, and the glory of God. All right, so here we are, kind of do our weekly recap, um, make sure we're all on the same page. So we know that he was written to the first century Jew who was toggling between Judaism and all the practices of Judaism versus Christ, right? And they're trying to decide, and, and anybody at that time, if they were to fully commit to following Christ, <coughs> excuse me, they would... Um, they would be giving up a lot, just not just socially, but um, there, there's that feeling of like, okay, well, am I? I'm stepping away from my faith. Am I? Am I doing the right thing and stepping away from the faith that I, I knew? Also, there were some um, uh, like financial impacts because of the way the relationship between uh, Rome and the Jews at that time. Um, and what we've discovered over the course of Hebrews is that um, the author of Hebrews, which is uh, likely Paul, but still, you know, we don't know 100%, um, makes this beautiful argument of how Christ is supreme to every Jewish practice there is. Every Jewish practice and, and figure that uh, any Jew would hold near and dear to their hearts, um, you know, Christ is greater. And we started off by talking how Christ is greater than the angels who delivered the, the Torah to the Israelites. We talked about how Jesus was greater than Moses, Abraham, and David. And we talked about that in different ways. Um, and Moses, Abraham, and David were pillars of, of the Jewish faith. Um, and then we looked at how Jesus provides the true and eternal rest, um, which is going to be more rest than what the Jews found in the promised land. Um, and then last week, we, we started to really unpack this idea of the role of the high priest and how the high priest served as a mediator between God and the people, and that there is a qualification between for anybody to be a high priest. One, they had to be, you know, compassionate towards those who were lost and those who are weak, right? Which was all of, you know, everybody in Israel. The high priest served as a mediator for those who were, who were falling astray, and it had to be somebody who was appointed, right? Nobody could self-elect themselves to become high priest, um, and. And, and we took a look at, you know, Jesus's priesthood, how, you know, he filled those qualifications because he was compassionate towards all of humanity. And he was appointed by God because it was God who's saying, you're a priest according to the order of Melchizedek, right? So God was the one who appointed him priest. And then, and then we looked at Melchizedek as a character and, and how we saw him when, when he met Abraham and the significance of that, how Abraham cl clearly knew that he was of God and much greater than him. And Abraham gave him a tithe and, and, and received a blessing from him. And, um, and we also looked how Melchizedek had no beginning, no end, no, no lineage, right? So that he, he's a bit of a mysterious character. But the fact that we don't know anything about him other than, than really that story in in Genesis with Abraham, it, you know, it tells us it, it's almost like a mirroring of, of Jesus, who also is eternal, has no beginning, no end, and no lineage. He just is, right? So there's a lot of that, you know, similarities between Melchizedek and, um, and Christ. All right. Um, 
with that, you know, as we kind of move in, we're going to look at chapter eight and um, really take a look at Jesus again as a priest, but like the gift that he brings and the promises that he offers. Right. So those are going to be the things that we're going to begin to, to look at in verse in chapter eight. OK, so chapter eight, I'll go ahead and uh, start us off, it says now. This is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the, hev in, in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man, where every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest since there are priests who offer the gifts according to law. Pretty much saying like if, if he was here, um, you know, we already, if he was here, it, it would make no sense for him to be a Levitical priest because we already have tons of Levitical priests who are offering up these sacrifices, right, according to the law. So for if he were on earth, he would not be a priest since there are priests who offer the gifts according to law who serve the copy and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make a tabernacle, for he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on a better promise, right? So kind of, you know, summarize what, what was, you know, talked about here, we're saying that like, yes, he was a high priest, but where was his seat? It was in heaven next to next to God the Father, right? Which is very different because that we're beginning to paint this picture of two different tabernacles. There's this one here on earth, right? Which has the holies of the holies and so on. And then there's this heavenly tabernacle and it's from this heavenly tabernacle, that's where Christ the high priest comes from, right? And it wouldn't make sense for him to come of the Levitical priesthood because we got plenty of them. But we don't have anybody who is in that heavenly tabernacle. Um, and then we, we get this language here of, you know, the, the Mosaic law and, and, and kind of the system of worship here. It was a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. Right. And there's an emphasis here, and we're going to see this emphasis throughout uh, in the study of 8, 9, and 10 uh, today, because um, this was a common way of dialoguing or, or writing at the time. And, and, and this idea of like, okay, well, there's something that's real, and here on earth is a copy of whatever is, is real and transcendent, you know, not of this world. And that idea is a, a platonic idea, you know, coming from, from you know, way before this, um, where uh, Platonism understood this idea of like, okay, there's the original, which is the type, and then there's the copy, which is the anti-type. So this idea of, you know, the earthly tabernacle is an anti-type or a copy of the original, which was the heavenly tabernacle. So the author is, is kind of using this literary style and this platonic you know, style of writing in order to say, okay, you know, we have this earthly tabernacle. This is where the Levitical priesthood, you know, this is where they serve. And then we have the, the heavenly tabernacle and that's where Christ comes and from and that's where he serves, right? And, and even though he serves the heavenly tabernacle, he's still a priest because God ordained him a priest according to the order of Melchizedek, and yet he is still human. So he still is able to fulfill those qualifications of, of, of what a high priest did. Um, and the unique thing is that he sits at the right hand of the Father, which makes him a ruler over all. So clearly, he is a very, very unique and one-of-a-kind high priest. Um, but he begins to, you know, uh, open up this, this door, if you will, into, okay, but every high priest is there, yes, to be a mediator, but to offer up sacrifices, 
right? So there's this transition, right? That is making a unique high priest, but you know, the model that we know of high priests is that they offer up sacrifices. So how does this priest offer up sacrifices? Um, and and we, we see like really here in um, end of verse three, where it says that this one also have something to offer. I want to like point out something about this because I think it's, it's actually a really cool point in my opinion. I don't know if you'll, you'll find it's lame or not, but this idea of offering or offerer um, in Greek is litur, litur, liturgos, liturgos, sorry, liturgos, okay? The, the noun of it, right? So that's, that's the verb. The noun of it is liturgia, which, where do we, where do we know this word from? Liturgy. Liturgy, right? So the offerer, right, is this idea in Greek of liturgy or litur liturgia. All right, and we know liturgy to be the work of the people, but the way it was understood, and I didn't understand this until I uh, took a liturgical history class during my master's, where it was used to describe when somebody like great did something to serve the people, right? I frequently described it as like, okay, liturgy is the work of the people, and so like, in liturgy, you have the priest doing something, the people doing something, you know, people make the offertory, we're all doing something. But really, the, the under, understanding of it was there was something much, you know, somebody who was great, like a ruler or a governor who wanted to do, make an offering for the people, right? That was the understanding of liturgy. And so we have this idea of Christ who is, you know, in liturgy, doing something amazing for us where he's offering um himself to us that is the work of liturgy right and and that's kind of a, a historical understanding of of what liturgy is it's like somebody great is doing something for somebody who's less so this you know idea that okay he's a high priest he's got to have something to offer well he does have something to offer and it becomes a foundation of our understanding of what liturgy actually is all right, let's move on to Hebrews. We're in chapter eight, verses seven. If somebody can read seven through 10. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with your fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Awesome, thank you. So, in, like in, in these set of verses, as as we're kind of you know building this this case, if you will, of like the old covenant and the new covenant here. Like to go up to a Jew and to say the Mosaic law, which was a covenant in itself like is outdated and needs to replace is like, it's a gut punch. It's like, you know, you know I, I, I can't think of a, a worse thing that you can say to a Jew to say like, yeah, the old covenant, it's outdated, right? So it was, it was a big thing for the author of Hebrews to say, okay, this was outdated. But the argument that he's making is saying, saying like, okay, but the fact that there is a second covenant, a new one, is indicative that the first one was incomplete or it, it, couldn't, it couldn't accomplish the actual goal, right? And so 
it, it kind of asks, you know, we need to begin to ask ourselves like, okay, well, well then what was actually being accomplished through the first covenant, right? And the, well, the, whole, law, you know, the sacrifices, what was actually being accomplished and where was it shortcoming for us to need a second covenant? Go ahead, Stephen, you're going to say something? So the old covenant where Moses's law is outdated? Yeah, I mean, they, they were um, incomplete and they really couldn't get the job done, right? Which is why we needed a new covenant, which is why Christ needed to come. But the question I want us to chew on is, okay, but it was there and it served a purpose. What was its purpose? Don't we still use it as an example of how to be a good Christian, the laws of Moses? Well, I mean, it, it did serve as an example. I wouldn't say necessarily that it was how to be a good Christian because Christ had not come and he hadn't really shown us, you know, a more accurate way of living. So in the law, like the law of Moses and the sacrifices and, and all these different things that were given to the people, what did it actually accomplish? Well, it was a start. I mean, uh, God was breaking truth to humanity, uh, you know, in, in steps and pieces. And this was the earth part. He started with humanity with the earthly side, and then he, he brought in the divinity and the incarnation and uh, fulfilled who he is. I agree that, that it, was, it was a process of revelation, right? And one of the ways that God was revealing himself, especially at the beginning to the children of Israel, was through the Mosaic law. Because what did they all of a sudden have to do? Like, even if we look at, um, you know, the Ten Commandments, one of the commandments was love the Lord your God, or, or sorry, you will, you will only worship the Lord and no other gods, right? That was... To us, that seems like, okay, yeah, there's only one God. To them, in, in a polytheistic um, period of time, it was earth shattering for them to say, okay, well, we're only going to worship God and one God and not multiple gods, right? So he was, he was bringing this, you know, slowly revealing himself. But then when you look at, you know, the other laws that were saying like, okay, if you, you shouldn't do this, but if you do this and, and do this wrong, then you've got to come and sacrifice, right? You shouldn't, um, you know, steal from somebody, but if you stole from somebody, you know, you, you essentially have to say sorry, but, you know, through, through the sacrifices, right? So what this Mosaic law was doing was giving them the sense of like what was right and what was wrong. Right? Uh, and hence, and hence it, it lay a foundation for uh for obedience you're right you know, it uh, was you know it uh, it gave them something to strive for uh and, and uh and learn obedience it was it, it was it was teaching them right and wrong and it gave them an opportunity to be obedient but when we look kind of big picture at the children of israel what was their track record of obedience <sighs> It's like they got an F <laughs> every time. And like every time they, you know, said like, oh, okay, we'll, we'll turn from our ways. We'll turn from our ways. Like it was just a matter of time before they, they went back to their old ways, right? So while they knew what was right and wrong, there was still something missing from the equation. And it was evident that something was missing because of their propensity to go back to old ways to doing what was wrong. So the new covenant was a way to show the children of Israel how to be obedient? It was definitely like taking steps towards it, right? Because now we, we have to ask ourselves like, okay, well then what was the new covenant? Like what areas was the new covenant hitting on that the old covenant couldn't? Right, so the old covenant is going to cover the shortcomings are going to fulfill the old, the new covenant is going to fulfill the old covenant, but also hit on the deficiencies of the old covenant.
It's actually in the verses that we just read. So yeah. you know how the covenant is Moses' law? What is like the new covenant? Is that like the Bible? Well, the new covenant is what Christ established for us. Right? His, um, his covenant, not just with Israel, but with all of humanity. Because he took on humanity. He died for our sins. And he said to all of humanity, if you come and worship me and are obedient to me, like you will receive eternal life. So that, that's the new covenant. It's, it's what he did with all of humanity. Versus the Mosaic law was really, you know, it was the beginning point of God's relationship with humanity, but it started with the Israelites. So the second covenant has a different approach. It's an approach that's going to penetrate the minds and the hearts of God's people. Because if we look at verse 10, where it says, for, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Right? So he's trying to penetrate deeply because if, if we ask ourselves, like, okay, so the Israelites knew, based on Mosaic law, that if I do X, Y, and Z, it's wrong. That God told me it was wrong. And I can you know, offer up a sacrifice and kind of be right with him. But what we know is that their hearts continue to deviate. So something was missing from inside. What God was, was talking to them, like, you know, it hadn't penetrated their heart and mind because it's our heart and mind that lead us astray. When we really want something, we go after it. So the Mosaic law wasn't penetrating to the heart and the mind, which is why we see that repeated pattern. And so this new covenant, its goal is going to be to penetrate deep. Does that make sense? All right. So. Wait, so with, like, the Mosaic law, that's, like, in the Bible where someone would sin and, like, they'd sacrifice a lamb, but it wasn't effective because there was truly no repentance to it. You just put put up a materialistic sacrifice and go about your day. Exactly. So it, there was an external sacrifice, which kind of, like, it, if you will, covered the outward motion, uh, the outward action that was committed, but it wasn't dealing with the heart, which is what we know, like the issues of life spring out of our heart, right? And that's what the shortcoming of the, of the old covenant was, couldn't really do that. And so as we kind of progress through these chapters in, in verse, in chapter nine, we talk about uh, more of this idea of, of the two tabernacles, right? And I have a um, picture here just to kind of make sure we're all on the same page. Um, the picture of the, the tabernacle, and it was designed based on an image that was shown to Moses on the you know, Mount Sinai. So he got very specific instructions on how to design the tabernacle, right? And and so this was the the basic layout of the tabernacle, but more importantly was kind of the the sanctuary part, and then the holy of the holies, right? And the sanctuary part was the part that included the the, the table of showbread, the altar of incense, and then the, the lampstand. And then when you pass through that through a curtain, then you got into the holies of holies, which is where the ark was, right? And it was an ark overlaid with gold from all sides, had the cherubim on each side, and in the middle was the mercy seat. And then the other thing there was um, the censer, the golden censer, right? And that holy of holies was the place where only the high priest went once a year, right? So the, the, the priest would be in, if you will, the sanctuary part, which is over here. Um, but only the high priest went once a year into the Holy of Us Holies in order to offer up sacrifices, um, you know, for himself as well as the people. And in that Holy of Holies where the mercy seat is, it was, if you will, like the closest proximity that one could get to God the presence of God, right? And that was in the earthly tabernacle. Okay, does that make sense? All right. Now, if somebody can read verse in Hebrews chapter 9, let's go verses 7 through 10.
but into the second part of the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this in the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifice are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience, concerned only with foods and concerned only with food and drinks, uh, various washings and fleshly ordinances impressed until the time of reformation. Thank you. All right. So what Hebrews is saying now is kind of what we said is that like, okay, all these sacrifices that were being done under the Mosaic law could only, you know, um, was concerned with kind of cleansing somebody from food or drink or various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. What it could not do was with respect to the conscience. It couldn't penetrate the inner workings of humanity. That was the biggest deficiency. And, and that's where our evil tendencies are coming from, it's from deep inside. And, and that's why we needed Christ to come. Because if we were really going to shift from this life of like, you know, drawing ourselves towards evil ways and committing all these, these wrongful acts, like the change had to come inside. The only thing in the Old Testament that we can do was acknowledge like, okay, this is wrong. How to fix it? Like, we don't know. We didn't have the system yet. But now we have the system, right? And it was Christ. This is why Christ needed to come. Right? Let's read verses 11 through 15. I'll go ahead and read them. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come. With the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation. He's talking about the heavenly tabernacle. Right? Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. Every high priest has to be associated with a sacrifice. His wasn't the, the goats and calves. It was his own blood. So with that, he entered to the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and ashes and of, of heifers Sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serving the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgression under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance, right? So the author is making this point. He's like, okay, if the blood of animal sacrifices would, was good enough to cleanse the flesh of man, the outside, okay, the external actions, how much more effective is going to be the blood of Christ, who is both perfect and human in cleansing the deeper being of man, meaning like our consciousness and heart, right? And the key is that like Jesus was human. So he took on the, all the faculties of, of humanity. And so he was, he is able to reach the unreachable areas. Remember in Hebrews chapter four, verse 12, when we began to kind of unpack this idea of like the high priest and how we have a high priest that we can sympathize with, right? Hebrews 4.12 says, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart, right? This word of God that's living, like it, it's Christ. We see him in, in, in the, the person of Christ, we see it through the, the word of God. We see it in the Holy Spirit. Like this is the ability of God to get into, you know, into and divide things that we, we actually can't divide. To, to say like, you know, the vision of the soul and the spirit, that's in, 
you can't divide them. You can't separate them. We can talk about them theoretically differently. There's a spirit and there's a soul. We can talk about it. But can we actually divide it? No. We can conceptualize it. But it can actually be divided. Joints and marrow, you know, bone and marrow, it's one of the same thing. But yet, the author is just trying to say, this is how powerful God is. He gets to that, that sort of depth inside of us. Right, the discerner of thoughts and the intents of the heart. So this is what the sacrifice of Christ is able to do, and and this is where evilness sits inside of us. It's so intertwined with the movements of our hearts and our minds that we need somebody who understands it all because he was human. And knows how to work through it to begin to bring these things to the surface, right? And this is the beauty of the new covenant, is that it has this ability to cleanse us from the inside. Right? But in order for all covenants to take effect, there must be a sacrifice of God. Right? Why, why, where does that come from? Right. I know that that idea that there must be blood. Mm. I was just, you know, I've wrestled with that, mm. just trying to understand. Like, I know that that was the rule in the old covenant, but like the old covenant is supposed to be like a type, sort of a foreshadowing, right? Of yeah. the new covenants, like a shadow of the new covenants. Yeah. So, is that where that came from? Is it almost backwards, like foreshadowing that Christ would have to sacrifice himself? Or is there some other reason why that? sort of why there must be blood in that. No, I think you're right in that the way God ratified the first covenant was Moses like sacrifice and he took the blood and he sprinkled it on the people and he sprinkled it on the, 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 the book, right? And it was that foreshadowing of Christ coming to sacrifice himself in order to really make this covenant come into being, you know, actually be. Because what was, well, it was a purification of our hearts and minds and our conscience that, that was happening. You know, the other part that was happening with the covenant was that eternal life was being given. How must it have been given? Through the conquering of death. So Christ had to die and then conquer death. So that we kind of see that full picture. That death had to be conquered through death, which is where that shedding of blood comes in. Because I think that there's this concept that doesn't sit well with me mm. that like God requires blood. Mm. You know, oftentimes you hear theories of salvation that really fixate on that, yeah. like the need to appease a wrathful God, which yeah. I don't think is an orthodox. No, it's not at all. Thought, right? No, it's so, not because it's the will. It was the will of the father and the son to sacrifice for us in order to, you know, if you will, do an exchange. He took what was ours which was the, the, the sentence of death, and he gave us what was his, which was life. And that we have captured in the, uh, I think it's the Thursday or Friday the you know, he took what is ours and gave us what it was, it was his. And, and so to the problem with that idea, not to digress too much, that there's a wrathful God who's out for, for, for justice, is that it pits the father against the son. And that is definitely not an orthodox like belief or understanding of, of salvation. Because if you pit the will of the father against the will of the son, then can you actually say that they share the same essence? Yeah. But when you have the father and the son and the Holy Spirit of the same will and saying like what we want to, is to give humanity life and take away the sting of death, then you have all things working together. All right, I think we're at verse 16. 16 to 18 in chapter 9, it says, for, there, for where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be a, the death of the tester, for a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the tester lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. And, and when you think about that, like, could salvation have been offered without the death of Christ? No. So the covenant couldn't, like, take full effect 
without the death and resurrection of Christ. So that's why um, death had to be a part of it, sacrificing the blood. Can you repeat that? You said that's why death had to take place. Yeah. What was the reason? Because the, the second covenant offers us eternal salvation. And eternal salvation means like there must be a conquering of death. So before Christ died and rose again, you know, death had its grip on humanity. That when we died, we were separated from God. But through his death, he, you know, and, and resurrection, he conquered death and then opened up the doors for all of us that when we die, if we believe in him and are obedient to him, will inherit the promise, which is eternal life. So for all that to take effect, the death and the resurrection of Christ must happen. Does that make sense, Stephen? Yes. All right. All right. Let's jump to um, verse 23. And, you know, in, in these verses, what we're looking at is, you know, since we've, we've gotten to this understanding of like, okay, the new covenant could not take effect without the sacrifice of Christ, because that was the only way to conquer death. So now when we take, if you will, like a closer look at, you know, Christ's sacrifice, we will be able to see why he just needed to die once and for all, that there was no need for other sacrifice. That, that's what these next selection of verses are. And again, remember, our whole book of Hebrews is talking to the Jew who is kind of struggling with, like, do I really follow Christ and, and give up these uh, you know, Jewish practices? And what was key? It was a sacrifice. So the Jews are like, okay, we're waiting for the temple to rebuild so that we can go back to offering sacrifices and so on. And now the author of Hebrews is saying, nope, you don't need to wait for that because Christ came and sacrificed and died. And now we no longer need these long lines of animals coming to be sacrificed, right? All right. So can somebody read verses 23 through 28 in Hebrews chapter 9? Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with him, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. Thank you. So we've been painting this picture, and Hebrews have been painting this picture of the uniqueness of Christ's priesthood, right? And here on earth, the high priest entered the holies of holies. But did he come and enter the holies of holies? No. He entered the heavenly tabernacle. Um, you know, it was, it's like he bypassed, if you will, the earthly one, and he went straight towards the heavenly one in order to bring humanity where? Into the presence of God. So he entered it as a human, right? He took humanity where humanity could not go by itself. And, and so when we you know, see that, like he took humanity and he accomplished the goal of bringing humanity into that relationship with the Father, right? He was incarnate, he rose, he ascended, and he 
sits at the right hand of the Father as a human. So he accomplished the ultimate goal, which is to bring humanity in communion and reconciled with God. And he sits there forever and ever. So now there's actually no other need for a sacrifice because he has come, he has took on humanity, he has pierced into the, the hearts and mind of humanity, conquered the, the passions and the desires of humanity, lived sinlessly, died a sacrificial death, and then took, took us up with him. And so there's, there's no other need because he's accomplished it for us. And so whenever we see you know, Christ sitting up you know, in, in heaven, he is the true representative, representative of all of us as, as a human. Right? He represents all of humanity before God because he is true human, which is why the church throughout history has made such an effort and sacrifice to defend the full humanity of Christ. Because if he wasn't fully human, then this, it all just breaks apart, right? How could he have pierced the hearts and the minds? How could he have cleansed our conscience if he wasn't fully human? How could, how could we get into heaven if he really didn't take on all of humanity? And that's what we call it a mystery. We appreciate there, there are some elements of it we can't fully understand, right? But we hold on to that, the baseline understanding of the world that he was truly fully human and if he wasn't then this whole process of salvation begins to break down any questions so far sure. we'll wrap up pretty soon here we're not going to get through all of chapter 10 we're going to save half of it for our last part uh, next week but we um in, in chapter 10, a lot of the, the focus is you know, reiterating, if you will, um, how the animal sacrifices were not sufficient enough and how Christ, you know, in his own sacrifice, fulfills all the need of, you know, any, you know, fulfills all the needs and there are no more sacrifices needed. But most importantly, like, it, it really talks about how, how he cleanses our conscience. Right, and this is what I want us to end on. So I'll read verses um, one and two of chapter 10, where it says, For the law having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then, for then would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshipers, once purified, would have no more conscious of sin. Right. So he's just making like a logical argument saying like, clearly the sacrifices were deficient because we had to do it over and over and over. So they weren't accomplishing the goal um, because they couldn't make us perfect and perfection being united with God. It couldn't accomplish that. Um, and really it's, you know, when the worshiper is, is purified, then we have this no more consciousness of sin. And in this consciousness of sin is, again, it's talking about how there's this purification from the inside of our desires and our inclinations uh, and our passions. That's the consciousness of sin. And, and when we think about our spiritual journeys, it's, it's the purification of our passions, which have that those you know, and passions in, in the negative sense, right? In the sinful sense, right? You know, we know it, we play with it, and it burns us, right? But that's our consciousness of sin. And what God is and, and through the work of the Holy Spirit is always working to purify us from that consciousness. But a big part of that consciousness of sin comes out of his obedience to his will. So the more obedient we come to his will, we move away from our you know, desires of sin. So we see this idea of obedience coming into the picture. So it's kind of attacking the same problem from two different angles.
We skip down to verses 8 through 10. It says, previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. By that we by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the blood of Jesus Christ once and for all. Right. So here's a question that I want to pose. It says here that sacrifice, offering, burnt offerings, and offerings of sin. Right. So he's talking about the Mosaic law and the sacrifices of the Old Testament. He says, I don't have pleasure in it. Why did he establish it? But then say, I don't have pleasure. That's the question that I want us to wrestle with as we as we kind of wrap things up. Was sacrifice a human concept or a divine concept? Did he teach them to sacrifice or did they develop the culture on their own? The Mosaic law, which was handed down to Moses based on you know images and, and, and instruction that he received. So it was a divine concept that was given to Moses for the children of Israel to practice. So God established it. Established it with him. And he says, I had no pleasure in it. I know God doesn't make mistakes, so there has to be some clear intention for establishing it, even if it wasn't an effective system. I like the way that you're thinking. You're right. He's not making a mistake. Uh, I think I think he wanted to uh, to have him his laws reside in the heart and the minds of people, and uh, the former covenant was only external and couldn't penetrate to the heart and to the minds clearly. Exactly right. You, you hit it right on the head, Ed. Um, so when we look like historically. It, children of Israel, sure, they were offering these sacrifices, but what do we see in their actions? Just all these sinful desires and propensities to come out. And so they were, they were offering these sacrifices, but there wasn't like a lasting change. Why? Because it wasn't penetrating the heart. And so that's why he didn't take pleasure. In it. it was needed because he needed to start somewhere with them. But it wasn't the end point. Right? The end point was the heart. And without that inner obedience, inner love and obedience towards God, right, the outward expressions that we do carry little weight. And, and that's key for us, right? That if, if I can, if I want everybody to go home with a take home point, like, you know, outward expressions bereft of inner love and obedience, albeit like struggling, albeit weak, like it doesn't matter, okay? But with, without it, Outward expression don't mean much. But even as we're struggling to love God, you know, and we struggle to love him when we struggle to pray. We struggle to love him when we struggle to read scripture. We struggle to love him when we struggle with our fasting and, and liturgy and all these different things. That's a struggle of love. When it's there, then the outward expressions matter. The outward expressions totally bereft of any struggle for love and an inner desire like to connect with God don't carry much weight or water. And that's what was happening in the Old Testament. Right? They're just doing these sacraments like, oh, I messed up. Give me a pigeon. Right? But there wasn't a desire to really change. And God has always been about the hearts of men. And that is extremely consistent with the way Christ lived here on earth. Because what does scripture, you know, capture time and again? He perceived their thoughts. He knew mm. what they were thinking. He questioned them in order to bring it out. Why? Because he wanted the insight. He was so focused on cleansing the conscience, purifying the heart. In order to do that, he had to go deeper. But he was the only one who knew. Right? And... And so our, a big part of our spiritual lives come in that, you know, the battle for the inner man, 
battle for the inner person. Knowing thyself is a huge part of our spiritual lives. Because when we work synergistically with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit comes and pierces, you know, to be able to separate the spirit from the soul and the bone from the matter, the, the desires and the intents of our hearts and reveal them to us. You know, however sinful they, they may be or wicked or ugly, reveal it, but then also be able to purify it and, and lead us towards a life of virtue. Right? That's the beauty of our spiritual life. And that's what Christ came to do. And, and that's how we are to grow closer to him. And that's where we're going to end tonight. So, so no matter how ugly the sin, the new covenant provides a way for salvation. Exactly. The new covenant provides a way of salvation, but we have to work with God in order to, to allow his spirit to cleanse us. We need to sow towards the spirit in order to, you know, take away from ourselves this consciousness of sin and this propensity for sin and rather um, you know, pursue him and, and you know, through this life of virtues. And I apologize, I just realized my camera is off. Any last questions? So as long as we work with God, like you said, work with God in the spirit to take away conscience and propensity for sin and pursue him, we'll get the forgiveness and change we desire. And, and that's captured a life of repentance. It's how we continually change and turn from sin and turn towards him.